Well, good morning. You know, it's um, particularly fitting that David and I are doing a, a tag team uh, here today. We worked together for a number of years as vice chairs of, of EEI, and then uh, when David was, was chair, and it was just uh, a year ago, June, in fact, the very day that he handed the gavel over to me as chairman of EEI was the day that Waxman Markey uh, passed in Washington. Uh, and he uh, said to me, okay, I did my part, and now you do yours over in the Senate. Well, David, I screwed up. I didn't get it. Um, you know, if we're going to talk about hot energy issues uh, today, I'd miss a great opportunity if I didn't congratulate David and the team at the Southern Company uh, for the achievement of getting the loan guarantee. But even more significant than getting the loan guarantee, it's that 90-foot deep massive excavation that actually exists today. Uh, their progress is really important to the f energy future of every single uh, one of us. Uh, and so we really ought to recognize uh, that great step forward. When we talk about not having an energy policy, but at least we're seeing some signs that some of the things that uh, we've done over the last couple of years are starting to pay dividends. But unfortunately, the loan guarantee uh, program uh, saga is just a microcosm of what we're going to have to work through when we start talking about climate change. I mean, loan guarantees were originated in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. It took five years of working with two administrations and congressional leaders in both parties to finally bring us to that announcement that was made two weeks ago. And that's on an issue that everyone agrees on. Uh, can you imagine how long it's going to take uh, to get climate change done? So I don't think we ought to be frustrated that the resolution on climate change policy is going to take time. I mean, heck, even within our own industry, it took two years of meetings at motels at airports all around the country uh, to finally reach consensus in the industry. And that consensus was really an historic one. We were the first industry to call for legislation mandating the reduction of carbon emissions. And we've been working towards a legislative solution to achieve that goal. And we're doing that particularly because we share the concern that's been expressed by bipartisan members of Congress, state and local leaders, business leaders, that the Clean Air Act is not an appropriate vehicle for regulating carbon. I mean, how can you install best available control technology on equipment when there is no available control uh, technology. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's why we're encouraged that uh, EPA has announced a temporary delay uh, in developing uh, regulations for, for carbon, but we've got to use that time. Unfortunately, the deliberations of the past year show that we have not yet reached a national consensus on climate policy. But what the last year does suggest is that support for the polar extremes doesn't exist, the do nothing extreme or the let's do everything, and there are several bills that we're trying to do everything. Um, we need to step into this in a way that's responsible and that's prudent and that's affordable. The framework's got to be based on minimizing the cost to consumers, encouraging diverse technologies, and recognizing realistic time frames in which these new technologies can be applied. Now, you've heard it before. There is no silver bullet for climate change. It's going to take a full suite of technologies to be successful. And it's got to include renewable energy, energy efficiency, DSM, advanced coal technologies, and nuclear power to achieve our climate goals. Many of you may be familiar with the Electric Power Research uh, Institute uh, analysis that compared a full portfolio of technologies with a limited portfolio of technologies. And in this uh, research, they found that if you have the full suite of energy technologies, that from the period of 2020 when you really get into reductions to 2050 when you're targeting an 80 percent reduction in carbon emissions, uh, you'll see a price increase of around 80 percent. Well, considering that's a 30-year period, that seems to be something that's manageable. So that's the good news. But on the flip side, what if we set that 80 percent reduction target, but we don't have nuclear power, we don't have clean coal technologies, and instead we're relying on a limited portfolio of renewables and fuel shifting to gas? Wholesale electricity prices under that analysis and scenario 
would increase over 200%. And I think once Americans realize this, climate change efforts will be just absolutely dead in the water. So as part of our climate change solution, we've got to provide funding for these technologies and then set targets and timetables that correspond with the commercial availability uh, of those technologies. We have to design an energy future for a nature that keeps pace with demand, maintains electric reliability, minimizes cost increases for our customers, and at the same time achieves meaningful reductions of greenhouse gases. And despite the fact that we've had a little bit of a reprieve with this recession, we are going to see increases in the use of electricity. Just think about all the devices. If you just emptied your pockets, how many devices didn't exist 10 years ago that you now plug into one of those wall sockets? Um, it's predicted that electricity demand between now and 2035 will increase by almost 30%. And then, as I've said before, we think about all of those post-World War II boom year plants that were built in the 1950s and 1960s that are nearing the end of their economic lives that will have to be shut down over the next decade or so. And then you layer on top of that concerns with energy independence and security and carbon reduction targets, and we have a very complex challenge. But we do believe we have tools that are available to deal with this challenge. Every credible analysis of climate change solutions, and whether it's done by EPRI, whether it's done by EPA, whether it's done by DOE, concludes that without new nuclear power plants, we just can't get there. And there's growing agreement. I mean, the, the national polls now will tell you, depending on who takes them, 65 to 70 percent of Americans support uh, new nuclear power plants. And that's why David's milestone is so important for energy policy in the United States. Second, coal has got to play a role. Coal produces just about 50 percent of the electricity generated today, and it's going to produce a lot of electricity for a long time in the future. But to preserve that coal option, we need aggressive development and deployment of carbon capture and storage technologies. Uh, Congressman Rick Boucher has an innovative funding proposal that would give EPRI significant resources which they could deploy. Uh, that amendment was included in the Waxman-Markey bill, and we certainly hope that uh, it continues to move along and we get that uh, funding provided. In the short term, energy efficiency measures, renewable energy, some conversion to, to natural gas will be the key to early carbon reductions. But when we set targets for the deployment of those technologies, we've got to reflect the diversity of geographic differences in our nation. As David said, in his area of the country, wind resources really are not, not a, a particularly good option. I will tell you, in Michigan, for about nine months a year, solar is not a particularly good option. Uh, so one size does not fit all. But the one thing I can predict with 100 percent accuracy is whatever our projections are today, they are going to be wrong. Um, Thus, we've emphasized at EEI that any piece of legislation has to include strong cost containment measures to protect consumers, because we really don't know uh, what the cost outcome is going to be. And one of the, the successes of this past year is that there seems to be developing a consensus that some sort of cost collar mechanism around carbon pricing is absolutely necessary to get widespread support for a climate change bill. Finally, as we shape this critical policy, we've all got to be working from the same page. This means eliminating multiple climate regulatory regimes. We've got to replace regulation of carbon under the Clean Air Act and regional and state programs with one comprehensive climate legislation that's designed to address the global nature of greenhouse gases. A single program that provides businesses with the flexibility to reduce emissions uh, and in the most cost-effective manner will give us the certainty we need to make the multi-billion dollar a year investments that are necessary to build the energy structure for the rest of this century. We can't afford to let energy policy get bogged down in politics. The reality is electrons aren't red or blue. We've got to keep working towards a reasonable starting position and we don't need to get the solution perfect 
right off the bat. We don't need to solve every problem right off the bat. There's going to be plenty of time for course correction. I mean, we're talking about an ultimate target date of 2050. Um, because if we don't get started on something, we're going to be left with EPA oversight of greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act, and that's an approach that virtually everyone agrees is unworkable. So I get asked very frequently, you know, is there any hope whatsoever uh, for good climate policy? Well, this year it is going to be a challenge, but I think whether it's this year, or next year, or the year after, we only have a hope of good climate policy if it establishes reasonable reduction targets and timetables that allow for the cost-effective deployment of these new technologies. Second, it's got to create a regulatory environment that promotes the investment in all technologies, particularly nuclear power and clean coal technologies. And third, we've got to abandon the prior efforts that we've seen to make climate change a revenue stream for every pet project and every special interest group uh, over on, on Capitol Hill and make it much simpler. Energy and climate change legislation, if designed well, can lay the, the groundwork for cost-effective transition to a low-carbon economy. But our job is to navigate this path in a way that maintains electric reliability, protects our customers from price spikes, and protects our economy from the impact of unnecessary rate increases. Thanks.